Hello, good morning to you. Thank you for joining me on this edition of News Desk. I'm Bernice Abubedulansa. Coming up, inability to afford dialysis driving some people with kidney conditions to their early graves. In the first edition of our latest series, The Dialysis Crisis, we'll hear the story of 54-year-old Georgina Mensah, who is living on a prayer. Meanwhile, former President Mahama demands a waiver of taxes and duties on medical kits, including those meant for dialysis in the wake of public outcry over the cost of treatment. As an immediate measure, I call on the government to exempt medication and kits for dialysis treatment from taxes and duties to maintain a critical lifeline for patients whose survival depends on this treatment. And later in the bulletin, gaping potholes, stagnant rainwater, and thick mud surrounding hills take over portions of the Kaswa Accra Highway. We'll hear from frustrated motorists in today's episode of our Potholes Exhibition. Also, former First Lady Theresa Kufour dies at age 87, 24 days to her 88th birthday. We'll also tell you about the sudden passing of former Minister of State, an MP for Ningo Pram Pram, Enoch Taimensa. We have details of these and more here on News Desk. Please stay with us. It's a pleasure to have you here. We are live on DSTV and Go TV and around the world via myjoyonline.com. Now, the high cost of dialysis for people battling kidney failure is forcing some of them to their early graves. A number of patients have told Joe News some of their friends they used to go to the hospital with for dialysis are no more. They claim their deaths were as a result of their inability to afford the cost of treatment. The Kolebu Teaching Hospital last week backtracked on an early announcement to increase the current 380 CD cost of dialysis to 765 following public outburst. In our first episode of our latest series, Ghana's Dialysis Crisis, we tell you the story of 54-year-old kidney disease patient, Georgina, who is just living on a prayer due to her inability to afford treatment. Maxwell Baba has more. Fifty-four-year-old George Napier lies in the reclined seat at a private facility, the Central Dialysis Center. She just finished her session for the week. Once a vibrant fish seller at the Tema Fishing Harbor, now confined by her kidney condition, unable to afford the lifeline she needs. Regular dialysis. I started getting the symptoms of a kidney condition when my daughter was in the first year of university. Even getting food to eat is difficult. I have to beg before I eat. My mother, who used to support me too, is also blind now. I don't have any helper. I used to sell fish at the fishing harbor and used to get support from my friends, but not anymore. You know the harsh economic conditions now, so I have to beg before I get money for my weekly dialysis at this private facility. <laughs> Fifty-four year old Georgina Ousu was compelled by the closure of the dialysis center at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital to seek treatment from this private facility. She was hopeful that the dialysis center at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital would be reopened so she could go back there. But the news that she received shattered her hopes of ever going back. She says the increase of dialysis treatment from 380 cities to 765 cities is just like the authorities pushing her from behind into a six-feet grave. 
and to bring my mom to this private facility. 400, 466. Her daughter, 26 year old Stella Uzu, is the only child of her mother. She says the weekly dialysis sessions have taken a toll on their finances. She says, but for friends and family members, her mother would have been dead. Mm, when they closed in May, where there, I think about a month later, or it didn't even get to a month, then you are there, and then one person's picture will be sent. So, so and so has died. Couldn't get money to dialyze continuously because um, I think Kolebu was the cheapest place, 380 cities at that time. Other facilities were taking 500, 550 at that time. And so, Moving from Kolebu, no source of income, and then you're supposed to wait 550 twice a week or three times a week. Most patients couldn't get it. So we've actually lost a lot of patients, both young and old. But the one I can count right now is about 12 patients mm. since Kolebu um, dialysis unit shut down. Because even bring my mom to this private facility, 400, 460 CDs twice a week, I don't even get it. So it's once a week I get for my mom. I'll call church members, I'll call friends, and then they'll contribute and I'll bring her. Lack of proper and affordable healthcare systems is one of the reasons young people hit the streets last two weeks to protest. One of them, Nasiba Bawa, was seen charging at the police. In a video that has now gone viral, she told me she was protesting because a 24-year-old man had died because he couldn't afford the cost of dialysis. A 24-year-old boy died this morning. His father is a teacher. His father is a teacher. Gave over 30 years of his life to the service. Could not afford transplants. Could not afford dialysis. 400 cities a week. What do you mean? Do you know how much taxes they check out every day? God will judge the government. Two weeks after the protest, I'm at Starbites at Wesley Gone to meet the Siba. She usually buys her lunch here. She says government must do more to cater for people who cannot afford the cost of dialysis. She says no one should die because they can't afford to live. I was so upset. Like, it got to me. And not even just because Hassan died, but what Hassan represented, even for me, that he represented um, a lost, like a country that had failed. Yeah. He represented the people who were dying and who died. He represents a lot of things for me. Mm. And so looking at him and looking at the situation that we find that he got to do it. It was as though like we were living in a memory yet to happen. Mm. I was angry, that's the word. I wasn't upset. I was angry and angry. And anger is a very rare emotion for me. Mm. It's a very important emotion for me. Like, for you to be angry, yeah. it's, it's, it means that the, the thing you're angry about is very important because I would say I'm annoyed, mm. I'm upset. To be angry, it's very important for me. These stories underscore the urgent need for the government to address the healthcare disparities in the country, ensuring that essential treatments like dialysis are affordable and accessible to all, regardless of their financial status. The lives of people like Georgina Mensa and countless others depend on it. Maxula Bagba, join us. Meanwhile, former President John Romani Mahama is calling on government to, as a matter of urgency, scrap import charges and taxes on medications and kits for dialysis services. He believes this will help bring relief, especially to the elderly. He was speaking at an event to mark this year's UN International Day for the Aged. He indicated government cannot be insensitive by passing on the country's economic challenges to people who depend on such critical services to survive. There's more in the following report. April last week, when an upward adjustment in the cost of dialysis services at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital from the initial 380 cities to 765 cities was announced, many, including patients, expressed disappointment with that increment. The hospital management initially blamed the upward adjustment on taxes and import duties on medications and kits for the dialysis service. The new prices were, however, suspended following public backlash. 
Former President John Dramani Muhama speaking at the Aged Conference organized by the Los Abuelos Foundation called on government to exempt medication and care for the dialysis services from the payment of taxes and other duties. Just this week, there was an uproar when the nation's premier teaching hospital, Kodibu, announced an increase in charges for dialysis treatment by 100%. This was threatening to put the cost of dialysis treatment out of the reach of many parents, patients and their families. The explanation I have read from the Kodibu teaching hospital cites the increase in taxes and duties of materials for dialysis treatment as the main reason for their decision to hike the price by 100%. As an immediate measure, I call on the government to exempt medication and kits for dialysis treatment from taxes and duties to maintain this critical lifeline for patients whose survival depends on this treatment. The government should not be insensitive by passing on catastrophic health care costs onto the people with life-threatening diseases, especially the elderly. On the government's debt exchange program, the former president described the inclusion of pensioners as cruel. And let me add the recent cruel start by the government in the retirement income securities and of the elderly due to the domestic debt exchange. I'm sure you've all seen some of our elderly pensioners picketing the Ministry of Finance because the main look of you we got, they went and put it into government bonds. And all over the world, government bonds are supposed to be the safest investment that one can make. Because governments normally don't default on, on, on their uh, debts. And so this is a novelty. I mean, the trust that our pensioners had, I want to put their small inside bonds today, they are suffering because of that. National Secretary for the Ghana Government Pensioners Association, Sergio Quist, bemoaned the meager pension benefit some of their members receive every month. We, government must enhance the take work pay of ordinary workers, ordinary workers, not MDs, uh, managing directors, not directors, not MPs, not presidents. They are taking enough already. In order to reflect personally in their retirement pay when they come on retirement. In fact, some retirement benefits are too meager to write home about. I have some members in my organization who take 40 Ghana cities a month. Imagine that. 40 Ghana cities a month. Some people are taking more than they can carry. The first aging conference was organized by the Los Abuelos Foundation, a non-governmental organization which champions the welfare and rights of the aging population who suffer from abject poverty and various degrees of deprivation through advocacy, research, humanitarian intervention, and programs. Eunice Aban Asare is the chief executive officer of the Los Abuelos Foundation. For the 1st of October on the UN calendar, it's set aside to celebrate the significant contribution of older persons to national development and also to the community and the families as a whole. So today being the 1st of October, usually as a foundation, we try to commemorate this day by putting together a set of activities, just as you are witnessing today, for to our heroes, our senior citizens. So what you witnessing today is the first Ghana Aging Summit um, to commemorate this year's 2023 United Nations Interna International Day for Older Persons. Well, we'll also be hearing from the Kidney Patients Association, which is addressing a news conference on the issue this morning, and we'll bring you that uh, when it is available. To some other stories now on News Desk. Let me take you now to one of the busiest roads that connects the western and central regions to the capital, the Kaswa Accra Highway. Sadly, the once glorious stretch has lost its glory. Gaping potholes, stagnant rainwater and mud from surrounding hills have taken over portions of the road, forcing commuters to spend sometimes hours in traffic on a trip that would have ordinarily lasted some minutes. 
Donnie Suspostina Safo has more in today's episode of our Potholes Exhibition Series. A few meters from the Kaswa toll boot is a stagnant pool of water. More like a naturally created government's flagship project. One district, one dam. The problem, however, is that the irrigation potential of this particular dam, created by cascading rainwater and mudslides, is not being tapped as it sits right in the middle of the road. Drivers navigating this stretch must drive with caution, mindful of the peril that awaits them if they speed up. With each rainfall, the asphalt on this stretch is covered with thick sludge from surrounding hills. Frustrated residents say for years, successive governments have looked on without providing a permanent solution to the problem. I'm not from Togo to Anangasangasa de Baham, you can see Sawis. And here they are Monkantira Omo. Gan and Penifono Mudri or Monfaho, no ma father Leno, no ma so hazard. Yesterday, we spent six hours in traffic from the tow boot to this point. Our leaders don't use this stretch each time it rains. They rather put on their sirens and use the other lane. If they were compelled to use this stretch to have a feel of how we spend so much money fixing our tires, probably they would ensure that this issue is addressed. Top government officials own houses around this place, but they keep mute and watch us suffer. Just now, my brake band came off. I have to buy a new one. I honestly don't see what the government is doing to help us as citizens. Every year during the rainy season, this is what we endure. Government needs to construct a huge drain to channel excess water and then get a professional to see how we can prevent the mud from clogging our drains. Drains designed to channel excess water are now clogged with mud and overgrown weeds. Right before my eyes, a vehicle got stuck, trapped in the mud, a testament to the unforgiving nature of the road. This stretch is a very busy stretch and ordinarily it's the only stretch that takes you from the central region to the Great Accra region with ease. It's a major highway. And just a few meters away from this point was the once vibrant toll boot that served as a source of income and revenue to government. So even as I struggle to pull out my feet from the mud, the big question is, where did all that money go to? Well, Obviously, I can't help this gentleman, but then hopefully government can do something to help him by getting this road fixed. John is a contractor under the Ministry of Roads and Highways. His job is to desilt the drains and gather the mud from the road each time it rains. But he laments he has not been paid for the past four years. Mami, for the past four good years, two months. Yeah, yeah, you are my highways. Four good years. Two months muna Initially when it rains, we quickly bring in our machines to pack the mud from the road. But for the past four years, two months, we have not been paid by the highways authorities. We decided to drive to Barrier, and for hours, my team was stuck in traffic. A kilometer journey from the Kaswa Tobu to Barrier, it took about two hours, 15 minutes. 
the police had to create a diversion route due to the intensity of the mudslide, forcing motorists to share one lane. I spotted this excavator, which had been deployed to gather silt. Unfortunately, it broke down. Honestly, it's really hard. Like, even when I take a drive with my driver and we go towards that car, it's four hours. We were in traffic for four hours on the road. Like, it, it's a nonstop thing. And even the, I went to Tuba, right? The road over there, they had it once I closed down. We were driving on the same side of the road. You had cars coming from this way, cars coming from that way, going towards each other. Like, that's not safe. Baby, I'm so to Now, I'm for you. Who do any more? No, I'm not and there's also the four block one. The cars are not fast. Each time it rains, everyone feels the pinch. The police had to create a diversion at barrier because the road is unmotorable. I am a motor rider, and each time it rains, I know I will have to spend my sales fixing one problem or the other on my bike. As drivers navigate the quagmire, they plead with governments to act. The question is, when will government fix this problem? Faustina Safo, Photo News. While talking about fixing the problems, the Ghana Highways Authority has commenced pothole repairs on the Accra bound stretch of the Accra Tema motorway days after joinings highlighted the perilous conditions motorists face due to the abundance of potholes. A visit by Joy News Monday morning reviewed some progress with some of the potholes successfully patched. Notably, the persistent traffic congestion caused by the deteriorated road near the La Plata Bridge has substantially improved. However, a number of potholes on the Accra bound stretch remain uh, not fixed. Draw News remains vigilant, closely monitoring the situation to ensure the safety and convenience of commuters. Now, many communities in the southern part of the Volta region have been flooded due to the spillage of the Akusumbu and Pong dams. There are fears of more communities being affected if the spillage continues. In a statement, the VRE said the decision to spill is as a result of consistent rise in the Volta Lake due to heavy rains. I'd like to bring you some more details on exactly how these communities are being affected. Uh, but first, here's a recap of the general flooding situation in parts of the Volta region from recent downpours. Some of the communities affected are Nogopo, Sonuto, Babanawukope, Pejakope, Ativuta, among others which has been blocked and completely cut off from the main Agbozume township. A head teacher in one of the schools, Mr. Shan Boko said his entire building has been submerged in the water, making him to lodge in a guest house with his family. This is where we live with my family, my wife, my mother, my children. It was May 23rd. Before we woke up, we realized that we are surrounded by water. After two days, it was west. So we decided to wait and see if things will be better. But all along, from that May till today, this is the situation in which we are. So early June, I have to move my family to a lodge, which is at the roadside. Mr. Shine Boko said that life has been very hard since the flood started and wants government to, as a matter of urgency, do something about the situation. We are trying for uh, philanthropists, people who can uh, help us, yeah, people who can come to our aid. You know, there are people around here, they don't have any other place to lodge, so they are still in the water. And they are sleeping in the water, they are cooking in the water, they are doing everything in the water. Look at the waters, they are all contaminated. You see here, uh, we don't have five more water. They've closed that for us over three months ago. To be sincere, uh, you cry for me when I tell you that when you go to other places, we have human feces, you can see it on the top of the water. In fact, we are dying slowly. So we are pleading politicians philanthropist, and uh, we heard of somebody called uh, uh, Ibrahim Mahama. He has been doing it for people. So today we are crying, we are pleading, he should come to our aid so that he can help us out. When they dredge uh, that 
uh, uh, that wetland over there called Trophy and the others in the room, we think the water can find its channel to that place so that we'll be at ease. We are all Ghanaians, we are begging. The secretary to the Sume Traditional Authority, Charles Nifson Agbagedi, said the traditional authorities set up a committee who identified some of the causes of the floods and came out with a report that was submitted to the authorities by yet to see some kind of sign of commitment. A few months ago, uh, we noticed that many of our areas have become flooded. So immediately the traditional authority set up a committee to go around to identify the places which have been flooded to find out the causes of the flooding. Representations were made to the various uh, stakeholders, the municipal assembly, the regional uh, coordinating council or the regional minister, then the government and the other reasons. We sought to find help from other places. Our elders say that you cannot hide your hydrocell to the uh, bathing tub. We are in a very serious predicament, so we need help. We are through this medium asking the government to come to our aid. We are also asking philanthropists and all people, both citizens of Soma, home and away, and other people to come to our aid. The Assemblyman for Agbozuma South, Gosen Ahiamaji, said the flood has really made them frustrated, thereby unable to go about their normal business. <laughs> Some of the residents have also been speaking for Joy News. Ivy Satoji, Joy News, Abuzume. Let's now speak to MP for K2 South, Abladji Fakumashi. She's concerned about the plight of the constituents as in, 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 and and uh, some of the communities Ivy Satoji just highlighted fall within her constituency. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, ma'am. So um, it, it appears that there is more than one cause of this flooding we have seen in the towns within your constituency. First, there's the issue of heavy rains, which have been uh, falling consistently. Then there is the issue of the sea going beyond its boundaries. Then there's a spillage of the Akosom Web and Pong Downs, which is you know, um, making the situation worse. Just just tell me what your assessment of the flooding situation in, and this morning, what the current situation is as well. Thank you very much, madam. And um, let me thank Joy for the work that you do on behalf of the people of Ghana, and especially the ones in Texas South. Um, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I'm not one to be lost for words, eh? But uh, um, I'm struggling to recompose my thoughts right now. I, I, I managed to come by one of the uh, lagoons so that you could see, but unfortunately the network is so bad, I can't join you on Zoom so you can see what, what the reality is. I have three traditional areas in Tatu South, and each of them has flooding. So the levels to which uh, this disaster has reached now is not one that I've ever heard of or seen in my almost 60 years on this earth. And when I speak to the old people, uh, nobody has seen this kind of thing before. I 
However, we call that um, in 2021, the year of my inauguration into Parliament, I, I did indicate what the Tada was case that it was important for the state to invest some money in a, for a, a, a temporary shelter so that when this disaster happens, um, we will have a place where we can keep the people so they can have a decent living. Somewhere they can sleep and wake up and go to the washroom and do the regular things that all of us are able to do. Unfortunately, we're in 2023, and I have not seen either the minister, well, the president, his vice president, or any of the ministers who uh, this affects directly, the regional, the Volta regional minister, minister for uh, works and housing, and minister for finance. You see, we, we have we've been left alone. Even Nagmo, set up by the state, Nagmo set up by the state, to address disaster, national disaster, eh? They have just been writing names from one household to the other, compiling names for two years. There's nothing that I have not done. There's no door I have not knocked on. But this situation that we have right now is not one that an individual, a member of parliament, who has a common fund that is trickling in, can do. This is an issue for the state. His Excellency, the president, should remember that in the Constitution, it says we the people, and the people of this part of the country, we are part of that collective, we the people. You have mentioned it rightly. You've, 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 uh, you've done a good job of playing Ivy, and Ivy, thank you very much. What Ivy did, you've played it. You mentioned that is, is the sea, is, is uh, the, 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 the rain, the flooding. And, and then the spillage from uh, uh, Amro to Kata and to my constituency, Kata to South. I mean, how much more should we be beaten before anybody responds to us? How much more? Should it be a blast of, a, of a, uh, uh, some uh, thing that you use in, in, in finding gold before we get the response that we deserve? His Excellency, the Vice President, was here a couple of weeks ago campaigning. He did not even come near where the, the flooding is. How is any individual? I, I hear my people telling me, Mama, go and ask some NGO. Go and ask some philanthropist. I, I know one philanthropist, John Dramani Mahama. Once again, yesterday he brought me some food. But is that all we need? We need the number of dress. We need to the We need the coin. Continue. Mm. The phase two of the, of the CD first to be continued. And, and that was my next question to you, because I know that there is a project uh, to put up a sea defense that has stalled. And I remember, this is not the first time you're complaining about this. There's a viral video of you demanding what you're demanding now. But it appears that, like you are saying, every door you have knocked on hasn't opened to you yet. So in the interim, what, what's the kind of relief you're looking for for your people? Again, you say that NADMO hasn't been there to do any uh, proper relief program or exercise. So... Between now and when the rain stop or when the spillage ends and the water begins to recede, how are the people of Ketu South going to manage? How I wish I have a simple answer to give you. I, I do not know how we are going to manage. I do not know um, beyond uh, comforting them as a mother should, as, as, a, as a member of parliament should. I don't know what else to do. I've been cracking my brains. I've read every document available to me. And my hope is in uh, something that I chance upon that's been done by World Bank. It's called the WACA, uh, West African, um, um, uh, West African, what? The sea has slipped my mind, area. Coastal area, West African coastal area. They have some money that they are helping countries that have as a shoreline to save them from the looming disaster. I've seen that Benin and Togo have benefited from that worker. I know that Ghana has put, in, uh, put one foot in there. I hope they'll add the other foot so that the resources that is available from this worker project can benefit my people. What will save the situation is one, dredging the lagoons 
so the water can recede into it. Secondly, it will be for us to continue with the sea defense project. Because as Benin and Togo continue with theirs, somehow it will push the water. I'm not a scientist, but common sense tells me that as you are blocking the, the water from one side, it will, it will find its way. Water, they say, always finds its level, doesn't it? Right. So beyond, beyond the, the blankets, uh, tin tomatoes, mackerel, rice, cooking oil, uh, mattresses that John Dramani Mahama has brought, which may not be enough for uh, two weeks or three weeks, I, I, I do not know what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm here biting my fingers and praying and asking God why two years, three years going on, three years, three years going on. I have not breathed since 2019. I'm suffocating. Right. I'm, I'm drowning. What, what, are, what are the municipal assemblies also doing? Because you speak about dredging the lagoon, for example, and that, that's the work for the local authorities, right? Listen. Look, I, 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 and I don't, what, I'm going to answer you, and I do not care how it lands in anybody's ears or heart. Nanado and his government, President Nanado Danko Kofado and his government, have collapsed not only NADMO, they have collapsed the local government structure. This assembly here is so toothless, they cannot, they cannot even provide a, a bag of rice or corn. They have not provided a one bag of rice or corn in the whole period that this has been going on. Huh? Everything, the president, everything you have packed, you have collected. Huh? I wish that I don't, I don't have to raise my voice when I'm speaking. But I'm so, I'm, I'm so up, up, up my nose in, 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 in this uh, mess that we, have, we find ourselves in. Huh? I cannot sleep. Every minute there's a call of some distress somewhere, and that assembly cannot even move. I wonder if they have any vehicle they can even sit in uh, to go around to go and see what is happening in the community. Eh? Local government and NADMO, do they exist only in name? Only in name. Eh? Madam, I just told you how, eh, almost 60 years, I've seen NADMO. Eh? In fact, my first job uh, was uh, as a young cadre for national mobilization uh, program that used to have its office at East Ligon. Uh, so the Samantha and I and a few others, we used to carry lentils and cooking oil for NADMO. Huh? Where is it now? Why haven't they responded? If, if they had done anything, would they have not seen, would they have not, uh, wouldn't they have invited uh, Doha FM to come and cover it? Because it would be a political game. And so if you haven't seen anything from them, doesn't that tell the story? Doesn't that tell the story? Huh? Doesn't that tell the story already? There are lots of uh, VH flooding here. If they had done anything, they would come with every journalist that they could, they can think of. Mm. You, all of you would have been here you, you've if just, they had done anything. You've just told us that you've been reading all the documents, trying to figure out a solution to this problem. I'm just wondering if you've also been speaking to... Um, authorities at the VRA speaking to um, the, the METEO. What are they telling you in terms of how long this is likely going to last? I have not spoken to VRA, um, but METEO, I get a, a, um, updates from them like everybody else in Ghana. And I belong to the uh, climate parliament. So a lot mm. of the things that I've read are generally what the world should expect with regards to climate change, global warming. These are the materials that I refer to. But locally, what I hear from uh, the, the, the platforms such as yours, uh, when we talk about what Matthew says, is what I have. But they are not the people that have, or whose doors have knocked. Right. Um, so, I, I mean, I... I know you are in the constituency, but how long yes. do you hope to be there? And, and if there are people watching, like your constituents have called out for philanthropists and other benevolent Ghanaians to come to their aid, how do they do that so that you can have a, a more concerted effort at bringing uh, to, to honor Joy FM and to thank you for what you are doing, they can, everybody who wants to support us can come to Joy FM. I think that it will also give us opportunities to have accountability 
on who is bringing war so we can properly acknowledge and appreciate them. Right. So I want to urge Ghana to come to Joy FM um, and, and, and please, please, please help us um, be our voice as you've always been. Uh, maybe, maybe my voice doesn't sound right or my choice of words irritates some people. Uh, perhaps they will appreciate you also. Be our voice and appeal to Ghana, appeal to the president of the Republic of Ghana. That his constituents, his, his people are crying and calling for him to come to the array. It's not too much. It's not too much to ask. I appreciate, it's not too much to ask. I, I appreciate your time this morning, and we'll definitely stay in touch. Thank you for speaking to us. That's MP for Ketu South, Abladjifa Gomashi, who is in her constituency because of flooding in the area caused by many factors, including the spillage of the Akosombo and Pond dams, um, some uh, waves crossing over beyond the sea's boundaries into the communities, and heavy rains that have been consistent for some time. Um, there, there are questions about the, the Keta Sea Defense Project and the updates on that. And you know here we are masters at total recall. So we'll be looking into all those things, and, uh, and also hopefully you will be kind enough to help the people of Ketu South and, and, and the communities in there to, to bring them some relief. This is News Desk with me, Bernice Abubedulan. So now Ghana is mourning the death of former First Lady, Theresa Kufo, who passed away yesterday. Mrs. Kufo was Ghana's First Lady between 2001 and 2008, when her husband, John Ajikun Kufo, was president. She maintained a relatively low profile as First Lady, but stayed even further away from limelight in recent times due to a prolonged illness. During her time as First Lady, she established the Mother to Child Community Development Foundation, which aimed to promote the healthy development of children and prevent the transmission of diseases from mothers to their offspring. Madame Theresa married John Kufour when he was 23 after they met at a Republic Day anniversary dance in London in 1961. They got married in 1962 and she has five children with John Kufour. She died at 87, a few days shy of her 88th birthday. Well, while we were dealing with the news of the loss of Madame Theresa Kufour, we heard that member of the Council of State and former Ningo Pram Pram MP in Octay Mensah, popularly called E.T. Mensah, has also died at the age of 77. We're bringing you more uh, as we uh, mourn these two uh, great Ghanaians who have lost their lives. To some other stories now, experts, research and the presence of new malaria causing mosquitoes in Ghana have found the new breed in Nima, the third community to have the Anopheles Stephensi after Dan Suman and Chuba. In the following report, Michael Ashale of our health desk explores the impact of this new breed on the country's efforts at reducing malaria. Ghana is the seventh African country to discover the Anopheles Stephensi. Even though malaria data covering the period of its discovery is not immediately available, experts believe it may have been present much earlier than the date of discovery. Professor Yao Afrani, a senior researcher in medical entomology and parasitology at the University of Ghana Medical School, and led the team that made this discovery. We don't know the extent of spread, how they are, but we found this by accident. Let me put it that way. Nima becomes the newest community to record the presence of the new mosquito breed, described by the Ghana Health Service as stubborn and rough. Through the work that we were doing, the research work that we did, we realized that Anopheles Stephensi is actually breeding within the city of Accra. When we found them, we found them only in two places, uh, Suman and Tuba in, in Accra. Right now, we found that within, within those places, they are widespread. We've also seen that they are also in Nima. These are new, uh, new places that we did not mention initially. 
number of persons admitted in hospitals for malaria cases increased from 351,000 in 2021 to 438,000 in 2022, according to the data from the National Malaria Control Program. Professor Yawafrani believes these numbers may worsen. Okay. So that means that in our country, if we don't do anything about it, what is happening in Djibouti and in Ethiopia would happen in Ghana. They would breed so much and they will cause epidemics of malaria within uh, Ghana. For many faced with tough life in the capital, this situation presents grave danger to their health. 26-year-old Joshua Asante is one of them. He migrated from his village to the capital in search of greener pastures. But what he found is far from green. Living here is not easy. Things have become difficult for me since I come. Even though money where I will use to buy clothes and all that things have become very, very difficult. Maybe I wear a clothes by three days. I haven't even removed it. You understand? Exposed to the elements, Joshua finds himself sleeping in the open, vulnerable to the relentless assault of mosquitoes. During the night, we could not sleep at all. And this time, I think we are still in the rainy season. I think the climate change, so we are still in the rainy season. And if this time like this, it's not easy. We cannot sleep in the night at all. Sometimes I will sleep around night. But because of the mosquitoes, my eye will open me like four times before daybreak. But the mosquitoes are warning us to understand. And one, th one th problem is malaria is worrying us too much. Every day, this one will say malaria. Every day, this and we don't have money to go and buy medicine to, to understand, nah, to treat that ma uh, malaria. So we are suffering here. We are suffering. The mosquito is disturbing us a lot. Samuel Morrison also sleeps outdoors where he wrestles with mosquitoes every night and often ending up on the losing side. You know, sleep well. That's why. All because of mosquito. So help us to house mosquito, please. The ones that suck is very big. It give us malaria cry. Uh, oh, plenty of people got malaria. Some people go home. In places like Dansoman, we observed the drains were stagnant and choked with debris. But Dansoman appears one of their favorite spots. And areas like this, like this drain that I sit on, stagnant with overgrown bushes, appears to encourage their population. This is News Desk with me, Bernice Abubedulan. So we take a quick breather now. When we come back, we'll bring you business news updates to stay. home is an accomplishment. When it comes to choosing our preference of living, we are faced with a dilemma. Will you go for affordability, comfort, or luxury? Well, we will help you choose your preferred home at a very affordable and convenient way. At the 2023 edition of the Republic Bank Love Affirm Habitat Fair, slated for Friday, 6 October to Sunday, 8 October, 2023, at the Kumasi City Mall, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. each day. This event is brought to you by your superstation, Love 99.5 FM, in partnership with Republic Bank. Powered by Airport City HDG Homes. And sponsored by DBS Industries Limited, Syntex Tank, the ultimate protection plus insurance product from Star Life Assurance, supported by...
Thanks for staying. Now, players in the e-commerce space have called on government to invest in cybersecurity to ensure a vibrant e-commerce sector. According to them, building resilient cybersecurity systems and effective collaboration with stakeholders will be critical in actualizing the needed growth. Here's a report from the second National E-Commerce Forum and Exhibition organized by GIZ. The second edition of the National E-Commerce Forum and Exhibition is a GIZ initiative which seeks to assemble players in the e-commerce sector to deliberate and brainstorm on the growth of the sector. The e-commerce sector in Ghana has witnessed continuous growth over the last few years. As of 2022, the penetration rate of the market stood at 27.4%. Analysts say the rate could increase to about 37% in 2027. Speaking at the forum, the head of technical at the National Information Technology Agency, NITA, Solomon Richardson, called for improved regulation to reduce online fraud. One of the ways that we are trying to also prevent that on a platform like that, nobody should just go and then just sign up like one, two, three at that. When you want to sign up, you sign up with your national ID. So it's, it's one of the regulations that we are now trying to come up with, that you as a provider will not allow anybody to sign up on your platform without a national ID or the approved uh, identification uh, system. Then what will happen is that you are now able to track some of these activities. Anybody who is signing up onto your platform, you have to sign up with your national ID, and then for those without a national ID, probably a passport, which can easily be verified, and then you have the details tied to certain numbers, and so when something goes wrong, you're able to do a proper audit. The president of the Ghana Fintech and Payment Association, Martin Awaga, spoke against the introduction of taxes on e-commerce transactions, warning that it will stifle growth. Um, we have a lot of uh, properties around Ghana or in Ghana that are not taxed. This is something that I think calls f for uh, uh, revenue measures. And so, uh, government should look at some of uh, this other additional source of income than uh, taxing a nascent or new industry that is now trying to emerge or providing opportunities for every other spectrum of the economic ladder. Cybersecurity lead at E-Crime Bureau called for cybersecurity and data protection education on the part of e-commerce operators to reduce the risk of fraud and safeguard data of users. People who are in this space put together or put measures in place to avoid this fraud from happening. But it will happen eventually and when it does happen, we need to investigate to find out how it will happen. How are they setting up these Instagram you know, accounts that look like the legitimate brand and they are using it to defraud people? How are they impersonating Mr. Super App over here, who is legitimately has a business right, that is providing a service as someone is pretending to be him right, and taking proceeds and damaging his brand in the process? So it has to be investigated. The second edition of the National E Commerce Forum and Exhibition was held on the theme Catalyzing Collaboration for a Responsive E Commerce. The watching news desk. That'll be all for business news. the heart of the illegal mining craze. Babies are being born. Their formation stages interrupted by poisonous minerals exposed by illegal mining. The baby is deformed. You can't find the sexes for the baby. The placenta had a lot of mercury and lead. But those who seek gold continue to expose the toxins that nature wants hidden. Cadmium, lead, copper, mercury, they are alarming concern. Why you bring it up there? They are mobilized into our water bodies and that is where we get exposed to them. The country's water bodies have become lifeless. 
Across Ghana, they flow like a plague, polluting the sea with the venom of illegal mining. You need about 10 to 15 micrograms per deciliter in your blood, and you are in trouble. In this document, the Rasta Sosoridoko and his team investigate how silently Ghanaians may be poisoned for gold. Poisoned for gold. Now, before I go, on average, 7,000 children are born with holding heart conditions in Ghana every year. And two-year-old blessing, Amawood Kwamba from Obwase, diagnosed with a condition, lived with it all her life, needs $7,000 to correct the defect. Blessing, along with three others with delicate medical conditions, have been provided financial assistance from the 5050 Club for Surgical Procedures. That's how we end this edition of News Desk with me, Bernice Abubeidu Lansa. Do log on to myjoyonline.com for more news. I appreciate your company. Do stay with us. We are your most credible news source. At 12, we are back with the major news bulletin.